Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out on a Wednesday afternoon in this beautiful weather. Uh, my name's Alan Ray. I do have the privilege of being the president of this college, and I would like to welcome you to the Cesar Chavez Intercultural Lecture. As I'm sure you know, the Chavez Lecture celebrates the late Cesar Chavez, a Mexican-American who started life as a farm worker and became one of the nation's foremost labor leaders and civil rights activists. And in the spirit of Cesar Chavez, we at Elmhurst College are endeavoring to make the American dream a reality for all who aspire to it. This presentation is also part of our year-long series of lectures addressing the topic education and crisis. And I don't think there could be a topic that is more appropriate for an institution of higher ed to talk about, talking about questions about what reforms work and which of them fall flat. What are the role of massive open online courses in our future? Why do boys have such a hard time learning? And many, many others. To begin our presentation this afternoon, Julio Alvarez, class of 2014, will introduce our speaker. Mr. Alvarez is an honor student with a major in English and a minor in Spanish. Please welcome Julio Alvarez, and thank you again for coming. Thank you, Dr. Ray, and gracias. Uh, and thank you all for being here today. Um, gracias a todos por estar con nosotros hoy. A simple farm worker once saw an injustice and decided to rise to the occasion. He became one of the most recognized Latino civil rights activists and to this day continues to inspire. After years of leading the United Farm Workers of America, on an organization he co-founded, Cesar Chavez, for whom this lecture series is named, became a symbol of peaceful demonstration and a promoter of Latino rights, lobbying for a mentality of equality for migrant workers. He stirred others to his cause and concurrently originated and embodied the saying, si se puede, yes we can, a chant and ideology that still resonates today. In 2006, this slogan proudly echoed in a nationwide protest promoting immigration reform. That same year, Dr. William Perez initiated a research study on the educational experience of undocumented Latino students attending college, thus tumbling the domino of a prolific production of future scholarly work on the matter. This timely accord mirrored the urgency to resolve the modern day dissonance this demographic these dreamers face. Dr. Perez was born in San Salvador, El Salvador, and immigrated to the United States as a child to escape the Salvadorian Civil War. Growing up undocumented, Dr. Perez experienced firsthand the denigration the undocumented often face. Furthermore, it was not until Dr. Perez was given the opportunity through the Immigration Reform and Control Act to obtain a higher education that he was able to aspire towards his own dreams. Dr. Perez brings to this contemporary discussion, a PhD in child and adolescent development from Stanford University, and is currently an associate professor of education at Claremont Graduate University. In his most recent endeavors, Dr. Perez examines the achievement, motivation, and civic engagement of undocumented students in his new book, Americans by Heart, Undocumented Latino Students and the Promise of Higher Education. Through this, he aims to clarify the misconception about undocumented immigrant youth, their role in their communities, and their self-propelled perseverance. Un simple campesino una vez vio una injusticia y decidió aprovechar la ocasión. Se convirtió en uno de los activistas de los derechos civiles de los hispanos más reconocidos y hasta hoy sigue inspirando. Después de años de liderazgo en la Unión de Campesinos de América, una organización que él cofundó, César Chávez, cuyo nombre lleva este ciclo de conferencias, se convirtió en un símbolo de la manifestación pacífica y un promotor de los derechos latinos, cabildeando para una mentalidad de igualdad para los trabajadores migrantes. Movió a otros a su causa y al mismo tiempo originó y encarnó el dicho, sí se puede, yes we can un canto y una ideología que aún resuena hoy. En 2006 se hizo eco de este lema con orgullo en una protesta en todo el país promoviendo la reforma migratoria. Ese mismo año el doctor William Pérez inició una investigación sobre la experiencia educativa de los estudiantes latinos indocumentados que asisten a la universidad. De este modo tumbó el domino de una producción prolífica de futuro trabajo de investigación sobre el asunto. 
Este acuerdo oportuno refleja la urgencia de resolver la disonencia moderna que este grupo demográfico, estos soñadores, se enfrentan. Doctor, doctor Pérez nació en San Salvador, El Salvador, y se emigró a los Estados Unidos cuando era niño para escapar de la guerra civil salvadoreña. Al crearse sin papeles, doctor Pérez vio de primera mano la denigración a menudo de los indocumentados. Todavía más no fue hasta que el doctor Pérez fue dado la oportunidad, a través de la Acta de Reforma de Inmigración y Control, de obtener una de educación superior que pudo aspirar hacia sus propios sueños. Doctor Pérez aporta a este debate contemporáneo un doctorado en Desarrollo Infantil y Adolescente de la Universidad de Stanford y actualmente es profesor asociado de Educación en la Universidad Claremont de Postgrado. En sus más recientes esfuerzos, el doctor Pérez analiza la motivación del logro y el compromiso cívico de los estudiantes indocumentados en su nuevo libro, Los Estadounidenses de Corazón, Estudiantes Latinos Indocumentados y la Promesa de la Educación Superior. A través de esto, él trata de aclarar la idea equivocada acerca de los jóvenes inmigrantes indocumentados, su papel en sus comunidades y su perseverancia autopropulsada. Damas y caballeros, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. William Perez. Thank you, Julio, for that kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here with you uh, today to talk about a topic that I uh, have thought about and have written about and have talked to audiences across the country uh, for the last five or six years. Um, and it's become uh, something that is the cornerstone of the work that I do on immigrant youth, and in particular, how to improve the educational access for immigrant youth. Um, and so uh, I want to thank Elmhurst College for inviting me uh, to come and share some, uh, some thoughts about um, the state of Latino education education uh, and, and to connect it to the larger concerns about the educational system and, and the challenges that we face in, uh, in preparing uh, an increasingly multicultural uh, society uh, to ensure that everyone has equal access. Um, you know, to the folks that I've that been hosting me throughout the day today, I've, uh, I'm not sure if you've noticed, but I've commented several times um, about the nice weather. You know, it, it, I mean, this feels like California weather um, and you know and, and the reason I sort of no, note that is because um, every time I come to the Chicago area I always go back to the first time that I came to Chicago I was working at the Rand Corporation just graduated from from graduate school and got my PhD and uh, was doing some work with Chicago Public Schools and so my first assignment was to uh, fly in to meet with some community-based organizations that were working on um, educational access issues with immigrant communities and this was the middle of January uh, now mind you I'm originally from El Salvador so I grew up in the tropics um, and then from there went to LA, you know, the, the Sunshine State. So coming to Chicago in the middle of winter was intimidating. So as a Californian, we don't own winter, you know, gear. Um, so I got my best pair of, you know, wool pants and uh, my best pea coat jacket uh, that, that I had that I thought, you know, this, this is going to do the job. And, you know, so the first day I'm here, I'm, you know, it's snow everywhere. It's really cold and windy. And I think, you know, I, I want to go get something to eat. So, I, you know, I, I found out that there's a soup and sandwich place. And so I thought, you know, it's three blocks away. It's a little chilly, but, you know, my gear should, should do the job and had a wool cap and everything. So I start walking and, you know, not even a block. And I feel that my face is going to fall off. I start to get tunnel vision. I mean, I'm freezing, and it feels like, you know, although I'm covered, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm shaking. So I run into the nearest building that's heated, and it's a pharmacy, and to, to just, you know, thaw out. And it was such a harrowing experience. I mean, all I wanted to do was get soup and sandwich and uh, ended up, you know, having to jump from one building to the next just so that I wouldn't, you know, uh, 
pass out from the cold. It was that that traumatic. Uh, in reality, as I think about it, I mean, I've told this story several times, and I think you know, in reality, it probably wasn't that cold. Uh, I just wasn't used to the cold, uh, and so I particularly appreciate that the lecture series uh, was able to slap me during this time of the year, so I I didn't have to uh, be traumatized again in my visit to Chicago. Um, but you know, but but one of the things I appreciate about this opportunity is that I never thought that I would get invited to give a keynote named after such a civil rights icon. You know, and, and as I was preparing my remarks for today, I thought, what would Cesar Chavez say about a naturalized American citizen uh, originally from El Salvador who crossed the border in the trunk of a car and eventually became a college professor and with a PhD from Stanford. How would Cesar Chavez wrap his head around that? I mean, what would he say? Would, would he characterize that as educational progress? Would he say, you know, we've made it? You know, the fact that this young man was able to do that. And, you know, and I, I, I think about that because when I am asked to speak to audiences about educational access, uh, and, and people, you know, come to learn about, you know, the things that I've been able to do, um, they generally think, well, you were able to do it because you were just smarter and faster, and just, you know, you were superior to, you know, the, the students that you went to school with that looked like you that weren't able to accomplish those things. And I hear that a lot. And so it's part of our, you know, idea of meritocracy in American society that we feel that if we just put in our effort, um, then you know we get the return that goes with that effort. And you know, as as I'll elaborate on my comments, you know, uh, this afternoon, in many ways, that kind of idea has propelled individuals throughout the America's history to excel and to make significant contributions. But on the other hand, that thinking has also limited our ability to problem solve issues of educational access. Because it's very easy to come to the explanation that, well, these students, they're just not trying enough, or there's something about them individually. So when I talk about my story about, well, how was it that I was able to become a university professor and be sitting in front of this uh, great audience at Amherst College, um, you know, and to talk about my research and my publications, um, I always highlight the work of educators that made that possible. Individuals in the school system that provided the foundation for my educational success. Um, that without them, my fate would have been no different than my classmates that were not able to go to college or accomplish the dreams that they had set for themselves. And it started from the moment that I came to the US uh, as an English learner. Um, and the teachers that began to build my academic confidence. So, um, you know, I've, uh, I, I hope that the slideshow um, starts. I prepare a slideshow um, that, to go along with my remarks that highlight that you'll see pictures of uh, students, activists, um, in part because I wanted to honor them as well and take this opportunity during Hispanic Heritage Month to not only celebrate the accomplishments of Latinos in the contributions to American society, but also to recognize that in the Latino immigrant community, those are the future superstars that will contribute to American society and that we will honor uh, in this time of the year that we've, um, uh, that we've identified as a, as a time to reflect as a nation about the contribution of Latinos. So I, uh, here we go, the, the slide will start. Um, and so part of what I wanna do is to bring attention to the faces of the future of, of American society and particularly the, the role, the central role that Latinos uh, will continue to play. Um, and, and part also is, is a tribute uh, to the young people that have inspired me to continue this work. Oftentimes it's difficult work because as you know, immigration and immigration reform is a very controversial topic. A lot of the difficulties that we have in reaching 
consensus about what we do and how to do it is because we can't even talk about it in a civil way where it doesn't break down to um, you know, an ideological uh, exchange where there isn't an engagement about what's important and what's true and about the, the social justice and the human side of this. Uh, and my work, in, in, in a way, is, is intended to do that. You know, through my training as an academic, I try to tell that story. So in elementary school, uh, as I said, you know, there was a teacher who was an advocate. You know, there was a writing contest uh, where then the whole school district, we had to write a children's book and we did the arts and crafts to create the cover and the design. And then the, the book story was judged by a children's author and then they would w select a winner for each grade level. Well, I wanted to participate, but I didn't speak English. I couldn't write in English. And my teacher could have said, well, you know, we're just going to give you an alternative assignment and, uh, you know, maybe next year when uh, your English proficiency is better, you could do that. She could have stopped there and that would have been the end of it. But she didn't. She went out of her way to talk to the principal and to talk to the, the review committee so that I could write my story and do the illustrations to go along with it in Spanish. Well, then I ended up winning that writing contest for my grade level at my school. And I got a chance to go to the district office and meet the children's author that was one of the judges. And that was a pivotal experience for me. I mean, that gave me a sense of possibility. I felt that I could be successful even though I wasn't proficient in English and even though I was still learning and I was still struggling and understanding what was being said in the classroom. When I got to middle school, I remember Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams was an African-American teacher who uh, was the most strict teacher that you can imagine. He's a, he had a, a, a former military career and then decided he was going to become a middle school teacher. So he brought that philosophy of discipline uh, and of diligence, of hard work, to his work as an educator. And even though I was an English learner, I mean, one of the challenges about English, learner, English learners' experience is that of low expectations. But Mr. Williams wasn't like that. He had the highest expectations. He did not expect anything less from me, even though I was still learning English, and even though he didn't speak Spanish, so sometimes we had a hard time communicating. He held me to the same high standards and expectations as everybody else. And I gotta tell you, I struggled. I mean, it was hard to keep up with what he wanted me to do. And I remember one of the things that he had us do was to memorize and recite poetry about the historical contributions of African Americans to American society. So we learned about Benjamin Banneker and Charles Drew and all of these historical figures, Booker T. Washington. So what we would do is we would go around to the different classrooms in sixth grade and recite in unison these poems about famous historical African-American figures. And as an English learner, that was hard. I mean, you can imagine, I mean, pronunciation and being in front of a classroom and struggling with that. But he helped me through it. He made me feel like I could do that. Uh, and so he was a pivotal person in, in my educational experience. When I got to high school, I had a French teacher who took an interest in me. You know, it, he, that boundary between being my teacher and my advocate and supporter, he took that away. You know, he reached out to me as an individual and saw the potential and encouraged that and provided advice even after I had taken, that was done with his classes and had moved on to other things. Um, in college, I had a psychology professor that was instrumental in putting me on the path to graduate education. He helped me to understand some of the psychological assets that immigrants bring into the school system that the school system not only fails to recognize, but actually strips away. And I'll say a little bit more about that after I, I talk to you about the work with undocumented students because as, as, we, as we look forward to how we can improve our efforts to support English learners, to support undocumented students, to work on issues of educational access for all Latinos in the U.S., we have to consider what the students bring to the school setting that can facilitate educational success. And 
we haven't really talked about that in conversations about how to improve their educational experiences. So I'm going to come back to that. Um, but uh, prof this professor of psychology, we were having a conversation. I had to come up with my senior thesis idea, and I was struggling. I didn't know what, what I was going to do it on. And, and I casually mentioned that I translate for my parents and that, you know, I was struggling to find out what this word meant. And he said, why don't you do your thesis on that? And I just thought, well, that's nothing special. I mean, I, I've been doing that since we came to the U.S. You know, when my parents, you know, they're still learning English. And so I had to translate because I learned English quickly, more quickly because I was in the school and they were helping me with that. And that became eventually my first published study in the Hispanic Journal of Behavioral Sciences that launched me into this career of being an academic and a migration and education scholar. This psychology professor did that. Now, when you step back and you look at the things that I've been able to accomplish, if you remove those pivotal connections, then you have to interpret my success in a very different way. Right. It, that you have to acknowledge that educational success for immigrant kids and for Latino kids, it's more than just individual effort. It's more than just the right pedagogical strategies. It's about the expectations that we have for students and the way in which we think outside of the box to support educational success. So we've had many, uh, I think, if we look back about how we've been able to address educational access for Latino students. There are several instances that we can point to uh, that suggest, yes, we made progress. So before the famous Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954, there was actually another Supreme Court case that predated that, but that actually was a precursor to uh, desegregation. And that was the Mendez versus Westminster case uh, in 1942. So almost 10 years before Brown v. Board, uh, in the state of California, we had efforts to desegregate. So that was progress. Uh, in 1975, we had a Supreme Court case of Lyle Nichols that said that you have to teach English learners and immigrants in a language in which they can, under, uh, and they can understand until they become English proficient. That was an important milestone. Another important milestone that we can look at it and point to say that's educational progress was the 1982 case of Ply Lordeaux. And in Ply Lordeaux, the Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution to deny educational access to immigrant children based solely on their immigration status. And the reason this court case came to be was because in 1975, in fact, several school districts decided that they were going to exclude children from schooling um, because of their legal status. So they began to implement, some districts began to implement policies that said if you can't prove that you're here with legal status, you can enroll. Others said, well, if you want to enroll, you're going to have to pay a fee. So you're going to have to pay $100 a year uh, or, or, or a certain other amount. And so civil rights organizations, Maldiv and others, uh, challenged these in the courts. And ultimately, these were consolidated into a single case that was heard before the Supreme Court in 1982. And that became an important milestone of educational access for immigrant children. It is a milestone that continues to be true today. By federal law, K-12 schools cannot ask children and families about the uh, immigration status when they come to the doors to enroll. But the question then is what happens after high school? And that's really where my work picks up because although Ply Lordeaux was an important accomplishment, it didn't speak to higher education. So increasingly, um, you know, oh, since the last immigration reform that we had in this country, the, the one that allowed me 
and my family to get legal status, uh, we have had an increasing number of young people that graduate from high school, many of them high achieving, as I describe in some of my work, but who despite that talent, right, who, who have really internalized the, the meritocracy ideology. You know, they, they work hard. They put in all the effort that, you know, that they were told that if they just try hard enough, they were gonna get the returns. But at the end of high school, those returns were not there. And there was no way that, there was no direction that they could turn to to find alternatives to that. And so I felt that it was important as a scholar to, to speak to that, you know, that it, it was becoming uh, in the early uh, 2000s uh, a, a growing epidemic and a growing concern. And so in 2001, in fact, the federal government decided we need to do something about this. And so several members of Congress in the House of Representatives uh, decided to introduce a bill known as the DREAM Act. Um, it quickly died in committee and it didn't go very far. But ever since then, efforts have continued to escalate to provide educational access and to provide a path to legalization to immigrant students who grow up in the United States with an American identity, who are English dominant, who culturally feel nothing but American, and yet, according to the law, they are not American. So to reconcile that, that disconnect, we have to engage in a conversation about the politics and the policies that relate to that, that experience of, of, of this connection, right? Um, and so since 2001, various efforts have resulted in uh, a variety of different policies that have been put at the, at the state level. Illinois, in fact, is one of the leaders in these efforts in that there is not only state tuition, uh, in-state tuition for graduates of uh, here that are state graduates that can go to public universities. There is now a fund uh, that is managed by the state uh, to provide financial support and scholarships to undocumented students. Um, there are also uh, private colleges and universities that provide everything ranging from partial scholarships to full scholarships. So we can look at that and say, that's progress. We now have 18 states that have in-state tuition. We have four states that provide tuition assistance, Illinois being one of them, Texas, New Mexico, California, uh, and there are others who are underway. So we can look at that and say, you know, we've made progress. The last time the DREAM Act was considering Congress in 2010, it fell five votes short. So the feeling was, we're getting close. We're almost there. You know, we just need to keep working on it. And the work continues. And so the conversations about immigration reform now are focusing on that ongoing efforts. And immigrant youth have played an important role in that process. They have played, in fact, a central role. And in fact, the Chicago area is one of the epicenters of the dreamer activist movement. The, the national leaders that have had a measurable impact on state policies and, federal com and conversations at the federal level about immigration reform. Many of them are voices that are, are coming from the Chicago area communities. These are folks that grew up here, view themselves as Americans and as members of their community, but they continue to face that limitation. And, you know, in many ways, states have been responsive to that. Um, and in fact, even foundations and private corporations and organizations have stepped up the effort to provide, to open up scholarship programs and internship programs to undocumented students. Um, you know, one of the things that I like to show when I'm asked to do professional development with faculty and with, um, you know, student affairs and missions folks is to give them a list of all the private schools and uh, colleges and universities that provide full tuition assistance. Um, and part of that is because a lot of schools want to do the right thing. 
but they're afraid about the political consequences. They're afraid about, are the alumni going to be upset? Um, are donors going to be unwilling to provide support because they, they think that this is too controversial, this is a policy that they may not agree with? Every single instance where that was a concern, when the policy was in place, and tuitions were being uh, allocated for undocumented students, and students be started to come to campus, and many of them to have a visible presence and organize and create student organizations. That fear backlash, that concern about the negative consequences in the public image of the, of the institution or the financial hit that perhaps might come, has never come. It never came for all of those that had those fears. And so I share, you know, that, you know, so all the Ivy Leagues are on board. Most of the highly selective colleges, liberal arts colleges and universities in this country provide full tuition assistance to undocumented students. And so we can certainly look at that and say that's tremendous progress. But at the same time, there's an alarming trend in recent uh, studies that examine the impact of undocumented status on mental health and on cognitive development. The conversation now needs to shift, and it is beginning to shift, to a consideration of how migration status impacts the entire family as a whole. Until about three years ago, the conversation was mostly or exclusively about providing legal status to dreamers and undocumented students themselves. There was no discussion about their parents, their siblings, or anybody else that didn't fit that criteria, the very narrow criteria of the DREAM Act. Um, but there's one thing that has happened in the last four years that has changed that tone of that conversation. And that is the historically high levels of deportations under the current administration. Since President Obama took office, there have been almost close to two million, we're really close to hitting the two million mark of individuals that have been deported. And in that time, there are several studies that are coming out that show that in fact, the undocumented status of the families of parents has a direct and measurable negative impact on the cognitive development of their children, most of which are US born citizens, right? And so there are approximately four and a half million US born children who are citizens, who are entitled to all the rights the citizens are entitled to, but who have undocumented parents. And their cognitive development and their ability to excel and do well academically is greatly compromised because of their parents' lack of legal status. So now we're starting to understand that educational access and providing uh, you know, opportunities for educational success for undocumented immigrant children or children of undocumented parents means that we have to rethink our conversation about comprehensive immigration reform. That the DREAM Act will do a lot, but the DREAM Act will fall greatly, will fall short of accomplishing the goals of educational access and societal integration. That in fact, as early as 24 months of age, we can see measurable differences in the cognitive development of children who have parents that don't have legal status versus those of immigrant parents that have legal status. And that in fact, by the time that they enter first grade, Latino children who have parents that don't have legal status don't fare as well in math and in language arts as their counterparts who have parents that have legal status. So there are these studies that are coming out that are saying, well, we need to pay attention to that because in fact, there are 14 and a half million uh, individuals who live in households that at least one member of the family doesn't have legal status. And that the anxiety level among immigrant families is the highest in mixed status families because there's a concern about deportation. When, when you know, when it's clear, when it's salient to you that you know 
so many people have been deported, there's a constant anxiety. Children come to children, immigrant children come to school with that anxiety. Now they themselves, you know, are not worrying about deportation because they're born here, but they're worried about their parents' deportation and their ability to dedicate and focus on the academic tasks that we need them to focus on is going to be compromised. So how can we expect them to do the best that they can do when they have that looming, they have that concern? And in fact, you know, there are several studies that have been done looking at, uh, uh, you know, immigrant parents and even immigrant parents that have legal status, that they don't have to worry about deportation. Even they report talking to their children, more than half, over 60%, 64% in fact, report talking to their children about what to do in case of deportation. And many of them in fact have contingency plans in case of what happens. And so there were even parents who have legal status worried that they might, got de might, they might get deported. Why might that be? I mean, they have legal status, they can prove it. Part of that is because there are many stories in the immigrant community about folks that have been detained and have spent several days, if not weeks, having to prove that they have legal status. The unfortunate thing about that, uh, as unfortunate as it is, it's even more unfortunate when you put it in a historical context that there have been at least two periods in, in, in the last hundred years where that has been the case, where immigrants that have legal status or U.S. born Latinos and Mexican Americans were deported because they look undocumented. So at the last Great Recession, we had a policy called the Me Mexican Repatriation Act uh, or policy. So during the next 10 years, so starting from the Hoover administration all the way to the next administration, um, thousands of Mexicans and Mexican Americans who were born here were rounded up and deported to Mexico. Right? These are folks that you know, had every right to be here, but because they look Mexican, they were deported. In 1954, we had another policy called Operation Webback, where the same thing happened. You know, rounding up of people and sending them back, many of them being U.S. citizens uh, or individuals that had legal status, but that wasn't taken into account. They were uh, just rounded up and sent back. And unfortunately, we're starting to see that again in a different way. But there are U.S. born children, citizens, who are now living in Mexico, in Guatemala, in El Salvador, and in other places where they are experiencing extreme hardship because they don't speak Spanish, they are American, their, you know, their cultural orientation is American, but their parents were deported. So they have no choice but to be there. Now, I spent this past summer in Mexico and, uh, you know, and actually had a chance to speak to some of these uh, young people who were deported. And, you know, it broke my heart to hear how difficult it was, how the schools were not pre are not prepared to educate these children who are not Spanish proficient. English is the only language that they speak. Some of them speak a little bit of Spanish, but they're struggling. And so in the conversation, so part of my work in the future as I, as I continue to do work in this, is to consider the larger context that we have children who are, you know, are not able to take advantage of the, um, the American educational experience because they had to go back to the, the, with their parents who were deported. I mean, there's a whole human tragedy part here that we're not engaging uh, in the educational system. So that's something that I work very hard to present, to include in conversations about how are we going to do immigration reform? Why is it that we need to explore the possibility of providing a path to legalization, not just to undocumented youth, but also to their parents? You know? And part of the way that I do that, and the way that my work highlights that, is by highlighting, in fact, the civic contributions of undocumented youth and their families. 
you know, there's this great misconception out there that, you know, that complicates the conversation that immigrants take more from American society than that they, than they contribute. You know, you ask people, you know, more often, you know, it's very quickly you're going to come across somebody who says, well, you know, why should we give them all these benefits? We're struggling as it is. Now, that's a very simplistic way to think about the issue. You know, there's a lot of different ways that we can think about this. And, and in my own work, what jumped out at me, you know, when I first started doing this work, I was primarily interested in academic outcomes. You know, how are these students doing in school? Are they struggling? If so, why? I mean, that was my central question. But what I ended up writing the most about was their civic engagement their contributions to their communities and to their college campuses and to the high school campuses. I was surprised to learn, as many people who I share this information with when I get asked to present about this, that undocumented youth were doing community service and volunteer work as early as elementary school, as fifth graders going to tutor the kindergarten and first graders. Right? That in high school, they were math and science tutors to U.S. citizen peers and counterparts who needed that support. Now, when you talk about the, when most politicians talk about the merits of providing a path to legalization, one of the primary arguments in this is an economic one. And the economic argument is, is a valid one, is a good one. There's great research behind that that shows the return on investment. But I think there's a limit to solely relying on this economic argument because by using solely an economic argument, we fail to recognize the human face, we fail to recognize the humanity, the shared collectiveness that we have with immigrant communities. And so I, I realized that by describing the civic engagement activities of undocumented youth, that I could provide another layer, another texture to the conversation so that we understand that it's not just a matter of finances. Yeah, the finances are very compelling. I mean, you know, that is a settled argument in the scientific community, that the contributions economically and the potential contributions of those that gain a path to legalization uh, will far outweigh whatever financial cost there may be. That's a settled argument in the scientific community. Unfortunately, it's not a settled argument in the political uh, and the policy making arena. And, and that's something that continues to be debated and, um, and, and I think it's, an, it's a conversation that needs to continue. But another part of the conversation needs to engage the civic contributions. So one of the stories that I like to tell about the civic engagement um, is the story of a young woman that I, I, I wrote about in the first book, and the We Are Americans. Uh, she, she actually came because her sister, I was interviewing her sister who actually had graduated from college. She wanted to become a lawyer and a civil rights lawyer to work for social justice, but because of her undocumented status, she was having a hard time getting scholarships to go to law school. So her sister came, you know, she was impressive on her own, so her sister came, she was at the community college and you know, was trying to get enough credits to be able to transfer, but her passion was to serve in the military. You know, she, she saw the U.S. as her country and she wanted to contribute by serving in the armed forces. Well, you can't serve in the armed forces if you're undocumented. And so it was a great rejection for her that she did all of these things to be eligible. You know, she got in shape, she took the, she studied for the, the, the exam that they gave you, she excelled in school, she did community work and, 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 and community service, and yet she couldn't do that. This was at the time when Hurricane Katrina hit uh, New Orleans. And so she's telling me the story, you know, she's, you know, I had just come back from talking to the recruiters and they said, you know, I'm sorry, there's just no way that we could, you know, work around this issue. We just, we, you know, we, if you don't have legal status, we can't sign you up. And she's disappointed, you know, she just come back from her community college class and she's sitting in, in the front room talking to her mom, watching the news, and she sees the devastation of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. And her mom says, you know, just casually, you know, somebody should, should, should go and help with that, you know, so volunteer and see what we can do. 
And so she said, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to go to the local Red Cross and see if, uh, you know, maybe I can make some, uh, some phone calls about, you know, uh, you know raising funds and, and resources to send to, uh, to New Orleans. And so she goes to the local Red Cross and uh, they said, well, are you interested in going down there and helping on the ground? You know, she thought she was just going to be making some phone calls and she thought, yeah, you know, she didn't think twice about it. Yeah, put me wherever you need me. And that's exactly what she said to me. And I, and I remember it because she just recalled it in such a way where it wasn't anything that she needed to deliberate about. That she saw this as a tragedy that affected her country and her community, and she wanted to do something about it. So the next day, she said, you know, she barely had time to gather her things. She's on a plane to uh, New Orleans. She gets there. And there are people from all over the country who are there to volunteer and to do in the relief efforts. And so she's in these conversations at the end of the day, you know, everyone's tired sitting around and, you know, and getting dinner and talking and digesting the day. And, you know, she's talking to people from Oklahoma, from Iowa, from Kansas, from Alaska, everywhere in the United States is there who, you know, to help out. And she decides that she's going to share her story with them. And she says, yeah, you know, I'm an undocumented immigrant and, you know, I'm just trying to work my way through college. I really want to work. You know, I really want to be in the, in the you know, in the, in, the, in the military, but I can't. And, you know, and she clearly recalls people saying, you're illegal? I, how does that happen? Why are you here? Because that did not fit their notion of an undocumented immigrant. They, they couldn't wrap their head around that somebody that they had demonized, that they thought as this bad person that had breaking the law, had been so selfless to come and help out with the relief efforts. And she noticed that right away, that people said, well, I, I, why are you here again? And, and, and you're what? You're, you're undocumented? They couldn't understand that. And when I heard that story, and the fact that she came away from that experience when she came back, she said, you know, there were people there from Montana, from North Dakota, that had a very different idea about how people like I really are. And I took that, you know, and I said, you know, I'm going to do the same thing. Because when people hear that, it's no longer consistent to the dichotomy that they have about legal or illegal, or documented or undocumented. You know, it forces them to come out of this uh, simplistic way to think about why we need to address this issue through, uh, through policies. Um, and, and it was inspiring, you know, and, and, and I think for people who come to understand how undocumented youth contribute to American society, um, American citizens have been able to benefit from that. Um, and that optimism, that drive, uh, is infectious. Um, I have met many people, and some of the people that are in these photographs, they themselves are not undocumented. And in fact, many of them are not children of immigrants. Uh, some of them may have, you know, immigrant parents or great uh, or, gra or great grandparents or grandparents. But the reason they become they have become involved in this youth movement is because they bec they're they're inspired. You know, and so undocumented youth bring this energy, which is not new. I mean, part of the contribution of immigrants, part of the vitality of American society, and there are others who have written, you know, very eloquently about this, um, is the sense of possibility that immigrants bring. You know, one of my concerns about immigrant Latino students in the public school system is that we look at them as English learners and as being deficient. Or we look at them as being undocumented and somehow being criminals, right? We see them from a deficit perspective. And by doing that, we fail to recognize the assets and contributions, the potential that they hold, not only to help us become more, uh, more broadly aware about our multicultural uh, reality, 
but also we deny them the opportunity to fully realize their potential. Um, and so, you know, the way that I talk about English learners, I don't assume that they're deficient in English. The way that I characterize them is they're emerging bilinguals, right? And in fact, you know, there's been several articles in the news recently about, you know, the fact that biologically, people who speak more than one language their brain is superior. Their ability to process information is greater than individuals who speak only one language. That's just, that's just one example that highlights how much we underestimate the psychosocial assets that immigrant youth bring into the classroom. That if we look at them through this lens of deficiency, we fail to capitalize on those assets. And the, most re the way in which it has been highlighted for me most recently, which allows me to touch on the diversity of the Latino experience, which I think it's so important to acknowledge, particularly during this time of the year when we take the, the time and, 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 and organize activities to celebrate the contributions of Latinos to American society through Hispanic Heritage Month, that it's important to highlight the diversity of the Latino population. So, so one of the things that I've appreciated about the impact on my work is that it helped us to understand that for immigrant children, legal status is an important consideration. They're gonna have a very different experience educationally, and they're gonna face a, a set of challenges educationally that are very much varied by their legal status. There's a lot of linguistic variety uh, among Latinos. Some of them are bilingual, some are monolingual. Some of them are emerging trilinguals. My most recent work has looked at the educational experiences of indigenous immigrant students. So these are students who are primarily from Mexico and Guatemala, where there are several indigenous communities. And in fact, in Mexico, there are at least 68 different indigenous languages that are spoken today. Now, some of the images that you see here on these slides of traditional dances and dresses and, and these kind of cultural activities, these are modern day indigenous groups that are immigrants, right? They're the, the, the Native American counterparts in Mexico, and they're immigrating, and they're here, and they're in the school system. And most people don't know that they're there. And most people don't know that they're trilingual. And most people don't know about the cognitive advantages and the cultural dexterity. I mean, think about it. These are young people that are navigating three different cultural spaces. When you do that, you develop a certain amount of cross-cultural competence. But that's not how we think generally about immigrant children. That's not how we think about undocumented children. My work with indigenous immigrant youth helps me to highlight these psychosocial assets that immigrant youth have. And my hope is that we consider that in shaping our opinions about what immigrant youth are capable of doing. Dreamers and undocumented students uh, in my work have made it very clear that despite the obstacles and challenges, they can accomplish great things. Indigenous youth are showing me that despite the challenges of prejudice and discrimination, both from the American context, but even within the immigrant community, indigenous immigrants are discriminated against. But despite that, they draw on those psychosocial resources to persevere. And if we approach the schooling and educational access conversations that we have about immigrant kids from this asset-based perspective, I think we'll be starting from a point that will allow us to build on those capacities and fully maximize their potential. And, and I think in many ways, I think that will be consistent with, um, you know, I think the, the, the saying that Cesar Chavez uh, is most famous for, um, that it can be done. You know, that we, we don't have to look at uh, undocumented or immigrant children as children that it's just too difficult and we're not sure if we're going to do it. My work suggests that it's very doable. It can be done and we must do it. Uh, and in the words of Cesar Chavez, si se puede. 
Thank you for your attention. If you have a question for Professor Perez, could you please come out to the side aisles? Let's try to. Professor Perez, thank you for your great talk. I'm wondering if there's a specific law or policy now being considered that you recommend. Um, you mean in terms of uh, immigration reform? Yes. Right, you know, uh, so President Obama last summer signed an executive order called DACA that stands for Defer Action for Childhood Arrivals. Now that's a great measure that it's a temporary measure that provides temporary legal status to immigrant youth that would qualify for the DREAM Act. That's, a, 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 I think, a, a, a useful summary of, of that policy. But that still doesn't you know, say anything about the parents who remain undocumented and many of them are being deported. Um, comprehensive immigration reform legislation was approved by the Senate that would provide a path to legalization to undocumented individuals, uh, approximately 10 to 11 million who live in the US. So it would expand it beyond the dreamer population. Um, that legislation has, uh, um, has reached the roadblock in, in the House of Representatives. And Speaker Boehner uh, has been quite clear that he will not take the, the, the bill that was passed in the Senate um, for discussion in the House and to bring it up for a vote. Um, and, and that's where we are. And in fact, just yesterday, uh, there was a group of uh, over 200 individuals that were arrested uh, on, on the Hill uh, in front of the Capitol building um, as part of a campaign to put pressure on Speaker Boehner to reconsider his position about um, uh, bringing the bill uh, to a vote to, to have comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, that's where we are. I, I, I mean, we're at, at, at a critical juncture. Um, and, um, you know, it remains to be seen. I think, you know, the, the current gridlock um, and the stalemate about um, you know that 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 we are seeing now is preventing you know that conversation, but um, but but that's where it is. It's it again. It's very close, and we don't have a sense of whether if or when Speaker Boehner will will take up that bill. Thank you. Hi, Professor. Um, my colleague. Yeah, you know, uh, among this list of uh, successes or, or uh, you know milestones that I, that I think we can celebrate as accomplishments is a growing network of organizations that provide uh, information and resources to uh, you know to uh, to immigrant families and particularly families where there may be a family member that uh, is going to face obstacles due to legal status. Um, you know, the College Board has been you know very active on this issue, and they they actually have a guide uh, and a report that talks about this. Um, I just learned about a, a group here in Illinois that has an online um, archive of resources for uh, for college counselors. Um, in fact, the uh, Illinois Higher Education uh, Commission uh, has a program that goes around and trains, the goal is to train all high school counselors in the state of Illinois as part of this uh, tuition assistant policy that was passed most recently. Uh, part of that conversation, as I understand it, is to provide training 
to counselors to provide the information that students need to be able to benefit not only from the in-state tuition policy, but from this fund that has been established uh, to provide financial assistance to uh, undocumented students here in the state of Illinois uh, to be able to pay for, for college costs. Uh, I know the, the law was passed two years ago. Um, in the first year, it was building the financial support for that. Uh, there is now uh, enough financial resources that the, the, this, the, the program is in its first year of implementation. Uh, so I, I can give you uh, my information. And uh, I, I, don't, I, I know that there's a, a website where all that information is located about schedules and sort of where they're going to be, how they're coordinating those efforts. Um, I'm happy to share that with you uh, offline afterwards. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, I hope this isn't too personal of a mm -hmm. question, but um, I mean, despite all of your accomplishments, you um, being an un being considered an undocu undocumented person and having two parents that were as well undocumented, do you ever believe that your um, cognitive development was ever affected in any way? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think what's slightly different about uh, my experience is that, you know, I came to the U.S. Uh, when I was 10 years old. I mean, so I mean, I vividly remember, you know, uh, you know, experiences of, uh, you know, uh, uh, confrontations between, you know, the the guerrillas and government forces. I mean, I, I, I remember all of that. And so, I mean, certainly that's something that, um, you know, I was part of my growing up experience. But by the time I came here, I had completed fourth grade in El Salvador. Um, and, you know, and I grew up in a small village uh, where, you know, it was very supportive. And, and the teachers were, were from, from that village and they were very invested in our learning and uh, you know very few resources um, but but it was a nurturing environment and and I feel I count myself fortunate to to have had that experience before coming here so by the time I came here um, I was sort of past that point where you know the the critical cognitive development occurs which is between you know right between you know, age two and six is critical I mean there's all of this research that sh the highlight how and why you know preschool universal preschool education is the best investment we can make as a society in terms of the educational system even if we do nothing else after preschool if we provide universal preschool and the cognitive benefits to children as a result of that are tremendous. I mean, you know, there. I mean, there are folks, there are economists who have, you know, crunched the numbers to calculate that. Um, and so, I, so uh, there is a connection here, I think, between you know the experiences of undocumented children who are born here of undocumented parents, and because of their parents' lack of legal status, um, a lot of times parents, you know, they fear any kind of interaction with government agencies. So even though there may be a preschool available down the street. The fear of deportation, the fear that they're going to be asked for information that they can't provide prevents them from enrolling their kids and having their kids benefit from that enriching educational experience. So part of the reason why there is that negative cognitive effect is because children who are eligible for these benefits, so preschool and you know early childhood, you know uh, uh, medical care and all these other things that, that we make available to low-income children, uh, parents are just the fear of deportation. And also, you know, the, 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 the messages that they've internalized, that they're not deserving of those resources, those are the, that's what causes this disadvantages because the, the parents that have legal status, they don't worry about that. So they go and enroll their kids in preschool. They go and they get, uh, you know, prenatal care or neonatal care or all of these things that are so important in those early years that can set the foundation for later uh, educational success. Uh, I was fortunate in that I was past that critical stage and, and during that critical stage, I was in a place that was nurturing enough. I mean, with the limited resources and the physical, um, you know, um, limitations of, of, the, of the tiny rural school that I attended, um, I was fortunate, but, but, but many children are not, and especially those that are born here of undocumented parents. Yeah. We'll take these last two questions. Well, 
Welcome, Professor. Um, my question is, uh, well, actually, it's a comment. I saw a frontline documentary on the prison industry. Mm -hmm. And what was especially saddening was the portion about the deportation growing industry. Mm -hmm. through building huge prisons and imprisoning yeah. illegal Im immigrants for yeah. years. And um, I wonder if you could speak to that. And on a personal note, my friend, was a she's a flight attendant. She's a Spanish speaker, and she worked for a charter airlines. Mm -hmm. And she would work the flights where they were deporting the mm -hmm. people, and they treated them very inhumanely. Mm -hmm. No food, no water, no west restroom breaks, like they were criminals. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, I mean, the, you know, uh, w one of the things that I've seen that I'm, I'm pleased to see is that increasingly activists um, and, and, and you know, in human rights organizations, in fact, are 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 shining a light on that issue. Uh, and uh, the the journalist Mayir Inojosa um, did. A, that, that I think you're talking about her documentary that she did on PBS on on, on these uh, private prisons. I, I mean, the effects on immigrant families. I mean, is devastating. I mean, parents are separated from their children. So in the meantime, you know, they have to figure out who's going to take care of the children. You know, to make sure that they go to school. The parents are experiencing all kinds of psycho negative psychological consequences as a result of being and these are folks that are law-abiding in every other way other than the fact that they're in the country without legal status which according to federal law is not a crime um, you know you're in violation of immigration laws but that technically is that doesn't even ca come to the same category as a misdemeanor right or even uh, all these violent crimes that we worry about uh, you know, that, that's the only thing that that they committed and yet you know they they spend months in that so part of the conversation about reform is that we need to address that as well because you know part of the reason why we have so many undocumented individuals in, in the US is because the system that we have in place for people that apply is terribly ineffective I mean the fact that if you're from certain country if you're from Mexico the Philippines and and other countries in Latin America you know you can go try to go through the proper channels but it can take you 20 years just to get your paperwork process. I mean, it just, you know, and so, you know, family is oftentimes 20 years is a long time to wait to be reunited with family. And so, you know, this whole private prison complex that's sort of emerging, I mean, that's just another side effect of the ineffective policies that are in place. And, and I think the fact that we're paying attention to it is raising the urgency to find a solution to this, right? That it's not, you know, so now it's not just about dreamers, it's not just about about undocumented families is now about, it's about family separation and parents having to go through these harrowing experiences and these private prisons um, and and having no recourse um, to be able to um, you know uh, be reunited with their families um, th the reason why comprehensive immigration reform has taken the forefront when it used to be just the DREAM Act, is precisely because um, activists and people who are working on this issue are highlighting the human tragedy of these private prisons and the poor conditions there, the separation of, of children. Children ended up in the foster care system because we can't fix our immigration laws. I mean, that, that just shouldn't be. No. Thanks. Um, my question over here. Um, oh. My question is, um, as an ally um, to the undocumented youth, I sometimes struggle um, to make comments to people who oppose the views as to why I support them if I myself um, am of status. Mm -hmm. What do you think are good arguments against that? Uh, arguments against? Uh, to support the undocumented youth even though I'm not undocumented. Right. Uh, so you mean in terms of critique from undocumented uh, individuals? People who don't support the People who don't support yeah. it, right. You know, <laughs> I think if we all knew even a fraction of the, the facts around this issue, it wouldn't be the contentious issue that it is. Um, if we knew all the, the, the important nuances, and not necessarily have a complex understanding of it, but even uh, an understanding beyond the legal, illegal dichotomy, that would go such a long way. And so, you know, 
part of the way in which I talk about it to people who, you know, perhaps are not supportive is to say, well, you know, the fact is that we have a system that is ineffective, right? So the policies that we have in place are so ineffective that people have to wait, you know, years and years just to be able to have, you know, the opportunity to uh, to get legal status. Now, you know, sometimes I ask people, well, do you think it's fair that someone who goes through all the, you know, the proper channels needs to wait 20 years to be reunited with their family or that, you know, because the, what, the, what, what the policy currently says is, well, if you want to get legal status, you have to leave the country, wait 20 years and come back. Now, the most reasonable people, I mean, there are unreasonable people that just, you know, it really, you know, you really can't, you know, get beyond the fact that they're unreasonable. But to most reasonable people, it, it just raising that issue, I mean, how fair do you think it is? I mean, we pride ourselves in being a fair and just society and, and, and one that, you know, if you work hard enough, if you, if, if you, if you make the effort, if you do these things that you're supposed to do, that, you know, we're going to reward that because all of us benefit from that. So, so most reasonable people, if you just say that, even just that one example, I mean, I have you know, tons of others that we can talk about afterwards. If they insist on sort of this position that, yeah, that's, I mean, what are they going to say? Yeah, that's fair that they need to be separated from their parents or their brothers and sisters for 20 years because we can't change the laws that says, you know, we need to do it better and more efficient and more effective. Um, I, part of the goal of my writing is to provide these kinds of bits of information that question these assumptions that people have who are resistant to uh, engaging in a conversation about why we need to do this. Um, certainly, I mean, for most people, the easiest thing is the economic argument. Look, if we invest in these individuals, you know, we're going to get their return on investment. It's going to be much greater, which means it's going to create jobs. And that means that, you know, your kids are going to have more opportunities because of the job creation that, that immigrants bring. That's a very compelling one. Um, but another compelling one is, you know, the, the human tragedy. I mean, if people are so callous, I, I mean, I have come across very few people that are so callous that they're indifferent to even just the few examples that I share with you. Most people, when they hear that, you know, the, the, uh, the reaction is, oh, I, I didn't even know that. But, 20 years, you know, people think that I'm exaggerating. I mean, I've written plenty of examples of individuals that have waited, you know, 15, 18 years trying to do the right thing. But ultimately, um, you know, the limitations are, are, are too severe. Um, so that's what I would say. I think most reasonable people will be compelled even just by, you know, pushing them to think beyond this binary that that I think it's so limiting and it just makes it so difficult to, to have a conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Press, I wanted to, want to thank you again for um, being with us. I want to give you a small gift for yeah. you to remember Elmhurst College by. Thank and thank you all for attending and thank you for inspiring us to think about an America that really can um, embrace its immigrant heritage and be a land of opportunity for all. We are um, going to have a book signing currently if you would like to purchase one of um, Dr. Perez's books or maybe just the most recent the Americans at Heart. They're over here and he will autograph it for you for a few moments. And then a quick reminder to my students from Honors 250 that we will be meeting in the Bryan room right after the book signing. Okay, thank you. Thank you again.